thanks for watching and today I want to present the proof of the Chen Lu in one dimension and I will also explain at the end why I call it the Chen Lu in case you don't know it. So what is the Chen Lu or the chain rule? Namely what it says is if f is differentiable at x and g is differentiable at f of x, so let's call it y, f of x, then the composed function, then g composed with f is differentiable at x, and the following rule holds, which, holds, which is very important, g composed with f prime, so if you want to differentiate the composite function, you first differentiate the outside, so g prime of f of x, and then you differentiate the inside, times f prime of x. With this notation, it's the same thing as g prime of y times f prime of x. And so now I will prove it in one dimension, in one variable. By the way, I will either do or have already made a video on the proof on several dimensions. And I highly recommend you to watch that too, because the proof is actually neater in higher dimensions, which is weird, but it's true. So first of all, let me give you a sort of a wrong proof, and I'll tell you how to remedy this. So here's the idea. Remember what the derivative is, it's just the limit of difference quotients. So let's first start with the difference quotient of g composed with f. So the stuff we're going to take a limit of. So let's calculate g composed with f of x plus h minus g composed with f of x divided by h. So. The limit as h goes to 0 of that gives you the derivative, g composed with f prime. Okay, and let's just write it, you know, what that means, what does the composition mean, that's like g of f of x plus h minus g of f of x divided by h. And Again, just heuristically, let's apply a neat little trick. Let's divide top and bottom by f of x plus h. g of f of x plus h minus g of f of x. And again, let's divide it by f of x plus h minus f of x and times f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And um, this is neat, okay, because if you take the limit as x goes, h goes to zero, this would give you f prime, and this would sort of give you g prime of f of x, not quite, because we have f of x plus h, we need something plus h to make this work, but that's not the problem. The problem mostly is the following. Uh, this thing, okay, it's nice and neat, but it could be actually equal to zero, and that would be a problem because we can't just you know, do zero over zero. That doesn't make sense. So that was a good try. You know, it would be nice if it works, but it actually almost works. We just have to tweak this idea a little bit. And so let me now tell you how to actually do it. So notice, let's talk about g. What would happen if you take the difference quotient? So what happens if you take g of y plus h minus g of y over h. And because I will use h for something else, for this h, let's just call it h squiggle. And the question is, what happens is, 
if h squiggle goes to zero, well, by definition, this should tend to g prime of y. But what does it mean for a number to be really close to g prime of y? It means it equals to g prime of y plus some junk term. So what we really have is that g of y plus h squiggle minus g of y over h squiggle, again, it equals to this number plus some junk. And let's call that junk sigma of h squiggle. So this is a junk term or error term. And you actually do this in life. You say, well, what is 1.0002? Well, it's 1 plus 0 0.0002. And no one cares about that 0 0.0002. It's just a junk term. But what is that junk term? What property does it satisfy? Well, remember, because it's junk, it's very small. So we do have that sigma of something goes to zero as that something goes to zero. And we'll need that at the end. Okay, that's great. And it's sort of supposed to remedy this stuff because what do we have? Well, we can multiply this by h squiggle. So what we have is g of y plus h squiggle minus g of y, what this becomes is just h squiggle times g prime of y plus our junk term. And the important thing to notice, this works even if h squiggled is zero. And you'll see h squiggled will be the difference of f's. So it remedies that part I erased where the difference of f's could go, be equal to zero. So this is sort of a generalization, but it takes into account that other weird case. Okay, and now let's actually do the proof. So there was some pre like prep work, and now let's actually do the work. So what do we have? Well, we want to calculate the difference quotient. So, g composed with f of x plus h minus g composed with f of x over h. That equals to g of f of x plus h minus g of f of x over h. And now let's focus on the numerator. Let's try to expand it out. And ideally, maybe some h will pop out or something. So let's talk numerator. So g composed with f of x plus h minus g of f of x. Look, we want to compare this term with g of f of x. So here's what we're gonna do. Well, how is that different from g of f of x? Well, it is in fact g of f of x plus some small term. So to make this work, namely f of x plus h minus f of x minus the original term, g of f of x. Because notice, you can actually, you know, add and subtract f of x, and the identity still holds. And this is great, because look, this, we'll see, is actually a very small term. So let's call that h squiggle. Just as before, because I want to tie it back to the formula here. And remember, this was y. At the very beginning in the statement, I wrote this as y. So what you're left with is g of y plus h squiggle minus g of y. Woo, how nice. It's exactly this formula. So we can just write it as, well, let me just write a huge equal sign. That equals to h squiggle times g prime of y plus sigma of h squiggle 
So that's what the numerator is. And now let's focus on the numerator over the denominator. So g of f of x plus h minus g of f of x divided by h equals to this over h, just to simplify the board work a little bit, that then equals to, again, h squiggled, uh, g prime of y plus sigma h squiggled over h. Very good. Now let's expand this out. So let's stay on this side. Well, what is that equal to? That is h squiggled over h times g prime of y plus h squiggled over h times sigma h squiggled. Again, some junk term. But I already erased it, but what was h squiggled? h squiggled was actually just the difference of the f's. So h squiggled was f of x plus h minus f of x. So you're left with f of x plus h minus f of x over h, g prime of y, plus f of x plus h, minus f of x over h times sigma, and let's expand that out as well, f of x plus h minus f of x, end of parenthesis. Okay, it looks like a horrible expression, but remember, we want to let h go to zero, because on the one hand, as h goes to zero, this is just, again, g composed with f, of x plus h minus g composed with f of x divided by h. So the left hand side goes to g composed with f prime of x. And now let's see what happens to the right hand side. As h goes to zero, this gives you f prime of x, g prime of y, which is just what we want, because remember y is f of x. So g prime of f of x times f prime of x. And let's just hope that this term goes to zero. Well, let's see. This term just goes to f prime of x. And the question is, what happens to sigma? Well, let's analyze this sigma f of x plus h minus f of x. Now, f of x plus h minus f of x, well, as h goes to zero, this actually goes to zero, and that is by continuity of f. Because what does continuous mean? It means that close to x, f has sort of the, the same value, so this difference goes to zero. In particular, remember that it was h squiggled, h squiggled goes to zero. So this term, which is really sigma of h squiggled, actually goes to zero, as h goes to zero. So indeed, we do have f prime of x, but with a term that goes to zero. So f prime of x times zero. And in the end, after this big explosion, what you're left with is simply our result, that is, g composed with f prime of x equals to, I guess let's just rewrite this, g prime of y, which is g prime of f of x, times f prime of x. Which is, ladies and gentlemen, the Chen Lu. Woo! So I know there was a bit of notation involved, but it's really a matter of writing the difference quotients and playing around with this a little bit. But again, I invite you to look at this other video I'll probably make. So I've already made it, but I'll probably put it for later. 
Um, and also, let me, you know, since you're still watching, hopefully, let me tell you why I call it the Chen Lu. Well, when I was a sophomore, I took this PDE course, and the teacher would always be like, use the Chen Lu, use the Chen Lu. And I was like, what is this Chen Lu? It sounds so powerful, like a martial arts technique, right? Like Chen Lu, okay, but <laughs> after a while, you know, I have to you know, it sounded so powerful, I didn't know what it was. And then after a couple of weeks, I was like, oh my God, it's the chain rule. I know, so um, basically made a Chen Lu be with you. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, so I hope you like this little proof. If you wanna see more math and more calculus, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.